Hey everybody, good Tuesday night. Welcome to Bowling with the Fef, a platform for you to share your unique bowling story live on our YouTube channel. I guarantee you this is a show unlike any you've seen before, certainly unlike any we've put on our YouTube channel before, uh, because instead of just one guest, we have an entire team of guests uh, waiting in the green room right now uh, to uh, come join us on the show. Uh, that'll happen in just a minute, and uh, I am really looking forward to what is going to come of this one, and I hope you are too. This weekend uh, is a special live stream event uh, for the Bowling with the Fef channel. Um, from Friday through Sunday, uh, I will be in Waterloo, Iowa uh, for the what I believe is the first NCAA bowling tournament, women's bowling tournament, uh, in Iowa State history. It'll be live coverage of the 2022 Peacock Classic at Cadillac XBC Lanes in Waterloo, Iowa. Um, Upper Iowa head coach Nicole DePaul came on the show, episode 38, discussed this tournament, and uh, all, of course told her bowling story, and later on asked me if I would be willing to come on and live stream it. So uh, I will be there uh, for the entire event. The competition starts 9 a.m. on Friday and uh, and Saturday, and then at 8 a.m. on Sunday. Uh, I hope you'll check us out live or uh, see all the action on the replay as it will live on YouTube uh, in perpetuity, I guess you could say. But that is the 2022 Peacock Classic. I'm certainly looking forward to it. Hope uh, that all of you are as well. As you know, Bowling with the Feff is brought to you by Chip Magnet Salsa, a local company uh, just down the road from me in Eau Claire, Wisconsin. A uh, husband and wife team that uh, distribute quality salsas, relishes, and more to 38 states and Canada. Now, if you're in Milwaukee, you can find it in places like Sendix and Woodman's. Uh, and if it's not in your neighborhood store, uh, don't forget to ask for it by name or order today uh, by going to chipmagnetsalsa.com. Chip Magnet raise your snack standards so let's not wait any longer uh like i said today is a, a special show one unlike uh any of the ones that we've done before uh so we want to get our guests and bring them on the the, the stream here and uh, yet another one just popped up um so we have uh kind of a a three pack here of uh, of fish heads. Uh, let's let's start. Uh, Todd, Dale, and Dinger um, up on uh, on my right on the screen, and Kyle Sullivan uh, down at the bottom. Guys, uh, welcome to the show. Todd, you've got some other people there. Why don't you uh, kind of introduce your crew? Sure. Uh, why don't we start over here with uh, Mr. Siminski, actually, or, or no, my sumo. Eric Siminski is one of our newer fish heads members. Uh, Tony Coffee here to my right. Uh, he's been on team for a while. I think everybody knows Dale next to me. We got Eric Dinger Mediner <laughs> and his cousin, Andrew Ewig, who is also a classic fish head. And then Kyle, in the bottom part of your screen there is uh, one of our newer members as well, Kyle Sullivan. Fantastic. Now, now tell me off, you know, off the top, we got to know, this is like nine different people. Are, are there a starting five and then reserves? Do you rotate? How do you do that? Uh, honestly, it's all based on the day and especially now with COVID, like we had a, we had a little COVID changeover even just tonight. So, uh, yeah, no, we all have, uh, varying jobs, varying commitments, family lives, stuff like that. So it helps to have a pretty deep bench these days. It's yeah. not like the days of old with no families, no kids and no, uh, no responsibility. So yeah, it's pretty much a nine person rotation. We have a schedule that's all put out there. And, you know, if people are wanting to bowl every other week. We have them set up for every other week. Yeah. So, that is. Cool. So the fish heads, uh, you know, I remember the fish heads being a team in a league that I bowled in, you know, in Thienesville back in 1997, 98, and it just keeps rolling along. Some of the members change. Sometimes the center changes. Where did this all start? How did the fish heads, you know, originate? You want to tell a story or? Go ahead, Todd. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, 1995. Uh, Dinger and I were employed at Regatta 2 in Fiendsville by yours truly right here, uh, Dale Traver. And uh, we were in high school, and we loved to, in the summertime, in addition to bowling, we loved to fish. So we'd be out fishing a lot of days, and but we had to get to work at night and, and come on in and, and get lanes ready and everything else. So uh, we sometimes didn't always tell Dale, but we like to use the snack bar as our fish cleaning 
area. So one day we came in and <laughs> we had a whole mountain of fish there. We're cleaning them out. And uh, there you go. There's a picture of the old regatta. And uh, Dale walks in, unbeknownst to us, uh, drops a few choice words, asking what about these fish effing fish heads. And anyway, fish heads just kind of stuck. So when we uh, we eventually joined uh, uh, the league there at uh, basically as an adult junior league uh, with the guys, we, we named our first team the fish heads shortly after that. And it just stuck. So now here we are, the fish heads. Yeah. Uh Kyle, since you're kind of, you know, the in the third square there, uh, what's it like to, you know, to join a team with with all that history? When did you join and what was it like? Well, uh, I think I'm probably the newest member. Um, I joined about five years ago at Bolden College with uh, Andrew, who was on the team there. And uh, when I moved to the area, he said, hey, we might be looking for another guy to, to sub and and oh, by the way, I both Dale. And I was like, great, that sounds fantastic. So um, got to know um, the rest of the guys over the last couple of years and actually worked with a few of them on our professional lives. Everybody's awesome. Always have a great time going there on Tuesday nights. And uh, yeah, it's really it's really fun to hear. Dale's got stories. Todd's got stories. Dinger's got stories. Yeah, there's always something. And, uh, you know, and, and then we've gone outside. We know each other from our families and we play golf. And so it's a... Uh, it's kind of a whole thing. I'm really yeah, happy to be part of this group. Yeah. What uh, guys, what does it take to be a fish head? Is it, <laughs> is it somebody who's got a certain sense of humor? Is it somebody who's got the bowling resume? Like Kyle said, he bowled in college. Uh, what, what does it take? It's not the resume. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know. You know, um, and it's definitely not a love of fish because Dale. I won't eat them. No, Dale and fish, <laughs> they are they are like oil and water. Um, I don't, you know, I, honestly, it's really kind of a personality. But we got family members. Unfortunately, uh, Digger's brother, Brian, can't make it tonight. But his brother also bowls with us. Um, you know, I think it dates back. A lot of us date back to the early days of Regatta. Steensville. Yeah, Steensville is where this all started. And, you know, Digger and I work in there. Brian worked there. Um, and, and for those, and I think, well, just about, except Simone didn't bowl there. And, 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 and Kyle, you know. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it's just, uh, it just works. It fits. We bowl safe. We bowl all kinds of other stuff. It's, uh, and it's a good time. You know, I think we're at a, at least most of us here at point in our bowling careers, we don't take it as seriously as we used to. So, you know, we probably wear our fish stickers and have all of our rules and find reasons to buy sausage to each other, right, Simo? So, did you submit the rules? No, rules have not been submitted yet. <laughs> <On the website. laughs> can, can you give me an example of of maybe a rule or two that you guys go by and what the stickers are all about? Yeah, sure. So you earn a fish sticker when you get hung, and that's not even. And there's violations. There, are, the problem with it is there are violations. So if you tag a fellow member, for instance, it becomes a violation where you have to double up all of your fish for the night. Um, and and we track the fish earned fish average throughout the season, and um, <laughs> we've had a few violators. Who's leading that? Uh, yeah. You're usually the one. <laughs> we've had a few violators. I didn't realize that it's a violation to tag somebody. I tagged Todd one night, and I wanted the 40 fish. So uh, our website is 40fish.com. You're welcome to visit. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, all the rules are there. Well, in the, in the first, the, in the first frame, meat frame. I want to talk about that. Right. Yeah. yeah. So they call it the sumo frame. I like to state uh, something to, uh, for the record. I've been a fish for about 15 years. I just had a hiatus. While I was gone, <laughs> they decided to come up with this rule that if you get hung in the first frame, you got to buy the team around the meat, which I have no problem with, except for when I lose. And even when I lose, I wind up buying five beef sticks. Nobody eats them, and I get them. So, uh, that's that's one. You of also supply them too. To, yeah, to documented rules. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah. you guys, I was gonna say, you guys mentioned Thienesville, which is Dale, where your bowling story basically started. Um, tell us about how you got into it. How I got into it, basically, it was my mother bowled there, and she needed time to get the kids out of the house so she could clean and go shopping. So it was Daryl and me at first, then when it was, well, it was all of us eventually, but um, dumped us off the bowl of junior league and that's how it happened. And um, then it turned into getting a little bit better. And then it was the last year in high school, one of my friends at bowl league, 
He goes, here, you go and you work for me, and I'll give you free bowling. So I did all his work. He sat at the bar and did nothing. <laughs> and I did all his work, and then I bowled like crazy. And then uh, um, what happened was uh, he just passed away this last year. Don Gazzano lived in Sockville. He would come and practice in the afternoon with my friend that I did the work for. He bowled with him, and he ended up on the wrong foot. Oh. So he and I wasn't good enough to bowl with him, so I just bowled on the side. And that's that's how that's how that happened. And then then the next the next year, out of uh, getting out of high school, uh, the junior coach was the association director, and he was retiring from coaching the junior league. So Ted Spella, one of the owners, he asked me if I would do the junior league. So. I basically, I learned how to oil doing the junior league because Fred Haller didn't want to get up on Saturday morning to do it. So I learned to do it and there was a lot of mistakes, but then I learned what was going on. And basically it was, it was you oil, it ended up turning you oil will give you free bowling. So he didn't want to do it. I oiled and i abused free bowling because i there was one stretch where i i bowled every day for about two years oh. and i was bound to improve i said i'm gonna improve and he just kept getting rejected but it's crazy uh 90 94 74 was the <laughs> going way back 74 was when i went from 169 to 194 and that day's 200 was pretty good and to go from that step to three years later winning the state all events scratch uh it's me and that just comes down to all the practice yeah when uh when when you were oiling I'm guessing you got pretty good at, at putting out the gutter shot. Um, I talked to uh, to Jeff Riggles, and he said he remembers going to Thienesville in the late 70s for what he called a non-pro type tournament. And that was a place where you had put out the gutter shot, and he said you didn't find that very many places. Um, is that something that, uh, I guess, the, the reason why you got so so good at playing up, up the ditch is by putting out that shot and practicing on it? Well, what happened is they had, they're not around anymore. Actually, I wish I wish there was one here and they threw it away. I wish I would have kept it for a museum piece. Um, they, were, they were made, I think they were made out of Green Bay. They were called Rotobuffs. They were green machines. All it was was a pad and it swirled. And then it just had a mason jar on underneath and the oil sprayed out and uh, tip in the front. And you just pushed it down the lane and, 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 and dragged it back. And... In, in the 75, 76, they were really cracking down on inspections and and uh, uh, rejects. And that's why you see the scores are really bad in those few years. And and uh, basically that machine, the way the pad went on the machine, it would just there was it was just held by Velcro and a Velcro right around the corner and a little bit on the edge was pulled up because of being fastened. So ease off a little bit like on one and two, and that's and he didn't want no rejects, so you oil it flat and you just learn that's what you're gonna do, and that's how it came about. Yeah. Um you had uh, quite a bit of success in that period of the late 70s, early 80s. You mentioned the state all events. Um, you won bowling with the champs in 1981. What was that like to you know to succeed? in front of a, a televised audience there that year that year 81 that was my i think the fourth straight year either fourth or fifth straight year i was on and and that was a time when dick richards was the head of the bowling proprietors which was red carpets and he kind of dictated that there was going to be no no rejects because it was going to look bad so the, la the lanes are tough. I had a high series at 681. So does that tell you anything that 681 now people will laugh? You know, and uh, the scores are tough. And it kind of played, it played like around five or six is kind of what it did, except for the last show it was 
here you had Niall Kondasek and me that basically were playing more towards the outside the whole time. We bowled the last show and we're almost at fourth arrow. <laughs> so I, it's still one of the highlights, even with all the PBA stuff. That's still, I think, in the local amateur scene in Wisconsin, I would still say bowling with the champs is probably the premium tournament to win. Yeah. Um, you mentioned the PBA, and uh, you joined uh, a couple of years later, 1983. Tell me about what your mindset was at that point. What uh, what told you that, hey, I'm ready to compete professionally, do this against, you know, better competition and on a, a Midwestern or national scale? Well, my friend Orb Wetzel from Final Act, he, he joined the year before, and, and he got me to bowl a couple not as a non-member. It was Eugene, Wisconsin, there was it was Paradise West and Racine, and it was Sun Prairie. And I bowled them both, and I cashed them both. I didn't make the finals, but it was all right. So then 83 at Penny's, uh, 83 was a lean year, and what they used to do all the time is we don't have the work. They'd do all this bumping stuff, and you'd lose a lot of money. And I started losing a lot of money. It was always like, the job I had was like one of the top jobs, but seniority wise, I was always like one of the last people to get it. And the money went down and I said, well, I'm just going to join to try to make money on the side when there was something close, you know? So I didn't do it full time in 83. I just nibbled around 84, 84 on, I went full time, except for obviously the last, last few years. But uh, yeah. that's what I did. It was try to make money on the side. How about uh, the first tournament you won? Where was it? When was it? What did it feel like? It was Resident Pro at Weber's St. Charles Lanes, 1987. And I, I beat, it was a step ladder. I think I was second. And it was, the, the title was Gary Timberlake. He just passed away this last year too. But the, he was pretty prominent uh, bowler. Type. So finally, Finally broke the ice. I had like probably three or four seconds at that time. And in those days, almost all of our tournaments were step ladder final. So you knew there was going to be five at the end and you had to survive. So if you could bowl good a whole time, it wasn't mean. If you could lead and you're still going to, doesn't mean you're going to win. But um, so I won that. So I finally break the ice. And then the next, the very next week, another place in St. Louis, Ellisville, and the tour was off. And they had three, they had three squads, ABC, and there was a whole, whole, I would say there was probably 25 to 30 touring pros that were there at that time. And then they had machine problems and we were, I was on C squad. So you oiled, they oiled early in the morning, you know, like six o'clock in the morning. There were so many problems. We had done at one thirty in the morning and uh, it was, let's just say it was told. So anyways, had 24 people in finals the next day, and I won. So, so I won that, and that was the last one of the year. So that was two in a row. The beginning of the year, I didn't win the first one, and the second one, I won the next one. So I won three out of the next four. Wow. And that's how it started. Yeah. Um, meanwhile, you know, or, uh, Hadler's is still rolling along, and that's around the time uh, in the mid-'80s when I started there. Um, this is the only picture i could procure from from back in those days um that, that's me at age nine in 1986 and you can kind of see you know the the silhouette of the star shield back there but um what drove me to hadlers was the fact that they had automatic scoring which was crazy to me in 1984 do you remember them putting that in yes i remember i remember unloading the truck <laughs> 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 that spell called me and Daryl. When you come down, we got something for you to do. And they had a semi truck outside trying to unload all the Astro 2 equipment in the boxes. Yeah, I remember them being like uh, almost like half a typewriter, and you put in carbon paper and it somehow related up on a projector screen. Well, basically, it was, it was electronic telescores, really, all it was. Yeah. All it did is just have it just moved in and out, and it just pressed down on the paper, and that made an imprint on the on the glass. That's all it was. Sure, it was an antique. Then it, <laughs> they're they're gone. You don't yeah. see any of them anymore. I don't yeah. think you 
find any parts either. Yeah, I bet not. Um, so you start having more and more success on the regional tour. And, uh, you know, I again, I asked Jeff, you know, uh, about that success, about, you know, the, you know, the times you'd bowl against each other. And he tells me that literally, he's not exaggerating, that you shot 300 against him four <laughs> times in your career in matches, regionals and stuff. Um, if that's what he says it is, I have no idea. <laughs> he must be burning his mind. <laughs> but he, let's just say this. He got me a couple wins by getting me irritated. So, and if anybody knows me, when you get me, when you can get me riled up, I would usually come ahead. <laughs> he he said he remembered that uh, he had beaten you in a championship once, and uh, that he kind of gave where it was too. He, he gave you like half a hug and a handshake, and told you that it means so much to beat you more than just about anybody. And uh, he said you kind of growled at him, and it took until the next <laughs> <laughs> the next I week's regional where he had... was at Schwagler's in Madison. <laughs> <laughs> he said he had to explain to you, listen, this is a compliment here. <laughs> is it? What does it feel like, you know, for you to win and to lose? Losing sucks. If you know me, that's what I'm going to say. <laughs> My dad taught me that. Second place is not winning. It's it's the first loser, and and that's what I pounded into Lenny. Lenny Lenny's a machine now, and uh, Lenny didn't know how to win. But he knows how to win now. Yeah. Um, but basically, it was my dad. He didn't like. I I could tell a story about him. He he, he was never a good bowler. He was one eighty left handed, so he was ready. Yeah, one sixty. <laughs> In a full roller, so he had in three steps. So here, you got everything bad at the time all at once. He was he was never going to be any good. But um, one time when we were family, they go up. It was maybe about five years. They go up to Crivets for a weekend, you know, camping with neighbors, and they have a tent. Well, anyways, he was going to go water skiing, and he's I'm getting up. I don't care what it was, and in his stubbornness. If, we thought that the boat went for a mile before it finally came out of the water. He, he just kept going, and he said, I'm going to get up. And he got up. Didn't last very long, but he got up. So that that's how stubborn he was, and that's how he kind of trained us. So, Yeah. I, uh, I actually had Lenny on the show uh, a little bit ago, and uh, I, I want to play back some of what he said, uh, you know, kind of about – that winning attitude that you were just talking about. Listen to this. I, probably one of the most influential people. I know I named a few others, but probably in my later years, I'll tell you what, that guy taught me how to win. We'd walk into tournaments and, and I was always content with, with making cuts and, 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 you know, making regional cuts and whatever, you know, but we both the team challenges. We'd walk in and he'd go like this. We're the best team here. Nobody, we shouldn't lose. You know, I mean, he had that attitude, that winning, winning attitude, that killer instinct. My God, you know, and it tended to rub off on me. So I, I owe Dale a lot. And now I realize that I'm still wearing the same shirt as I was in that. <laughs> it was that. Tell me, you know, what he talked about, that that winning attitude. We shouldn't lose. Was that how you felt or was that a way of motivating the other guys or both? It was both. We were the best. We were one of the best teams. You know, it was, you, you know, until you got all, until the team channels kind of turned where you had all the touring amateur pros, whatever you want to call them, that kind of, kind of got wrecked on the brackets because they were abusing the way it was set up. I mean, it was supposed to be a regional thing for teams, and all of a sudden, before you know it, you had... Now we're probably all tour champions. We're all bowling each other, mixing the bowlers up. And there would be five guys that worked, and all they did is bowl. And I still won't forget the time we made the final, we made the the the, the grand finals. It was at New Orleans, and it was in an arena. And all these people are coming up to us because they'd have, they'd, it was on TV, you know, televised when it was on that prime. And uh, they'd have, they list a poll, person in there would say their occupation. We were the only five guys that had an actual job behind their name that didn't say bowler. 
So they were all coming up to us saying, that's really good. You're, you're actually guys work and, and, and do this on the side, you know, even though we didn't win, we got, I think we got third, but regardless, you know, that that's how it was. Yeah. You know, that team, you know, to come together, you know, for you guys took, we'll say an interesting approach, uh, you know, from your teammate, Gus Yanaris. Um, He was also on the show. Um, he talked about how he talked to Lenny about this, you know, for lack of a better term, I'll call it super team uh, that he wanted to put together. And then he comes up with this plan to come to you guys and say, hey, you're the last one. Everybody else is in. Here, here's what he said about that. It was geared for, you know, locals, guys that bowl league together to come and enter. Um. I didn't want that. I mean, I wanted, you know, to bowl some decent bowlers. So I talked with Lenny and I says, Hey, what if we get so, 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 and so, and it was, yeah, let's give it a shot. The next day I contacted Dale Traver. He was the first guy I talked to. And I told him, cause we, the other two guys we picked out were Daryshevsky and Steve Brinkman. So I go up to Dale. I go, Dale, I says, yeah, we want to get this team to bowl, you know, the first one of Brunswick world team challenge. Yeah, he goes, I heard about that. So, you know, after some coursing, he finally agreed. He goes, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll try it. We'll, we'll see, you know, a couple tournaments, see how we do. So how long did it take before you learned that you weren't the last guy who needed to come in to make that team? Because he said that to everybody. <laughs> and you talk to each other. <laughs> I mean, he, he kind of lied about it, but well, yeah, he put the right pieces together. Um, we didn't really hang out much after we bowled. Everybody kind of went their own ways, but I always told him, I said, if you get a good sponsor, I will bowl at you. I was not unhappy with who I was with, even though some of the people took it the wrong way when I finally. I agreed to it. Uh, he, Jeff Lynn sponsored us because because of them. We were making the TV shows for a Team Challenge, and Jeff was a great backer for many years and a uh, great guy. And uh, um, I don't think many teams could say they bowled competitively and won won for twenty some years, maybe twenty five years, thirty years almost. I mean, it's pretty hard for us to win now. We're we're all in our or Lenny's not, but we're all in our sixties, so. The good days are gone. There's no question about that. But um, uh, he pieced, Gus pieced the right combination together. That's all I can say. Yeah. It's when? Oh, go ahead. I, I didn't mean to. Well, I'm just saying it's all history. What happened? And and, and I there was a lot of good teams, but I got to say I can't talk back about the 20s and 30s and 40s from the golden era of Milwaukee team bowling, but. I still say for Wisconsin, we were one of the top teams. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the record proves that. Um, meanwhile, uh, you end up with a chance to get into the ownership group uh, for what was Hadler Lanes and would become Regatta 2. How did that all work out? And what was that like to, you know, to, to own a piece of the place where, where it all started for you? Uh, I could say a lot of things, um, good and bad. Uh, all I can say is this, don't have a lot of partners. <laughs> Seven people is way too many. Yeah. Uh, it was nice. It was a lot of work. It was, things was run down, especially when Spella sold it off to group that turned it into duck pins and really wrecked the foundation of the back end of the lanes. And then that lasted like three years and they leased it out to somebody else to put in a bunch of used machines that the guy didn't know what he was getting. They were in really bad shape. So basically started all over and try to get the junk running is what it came down to. We got to run pretty good. It was a lot of money though too, but uh, um, it was nice being there. Um, the problem is part two of the partners got married and the wife's wanted out and it was all three. They agreed to sell it on a land contract, which I didn't agree on, but I had to agree to, it wasn't, we weren't going forward from where we were at. And 
And then unfortunately, it was only another year and a half later, the person that had it, uh, had a fire. And that's about all I can say about that. Yeah. Um, when you got into that, I would assume this is around the time when um, Todd and, and Dinger, uh, maybe others, kind of got into the picture and, you know, the fish heads were formed. Uh, but Todd, Dinger, why don't you tell me about, you know, how you guys met Dale and, uh, you know, and ended up working <laughs> with him, bowling with him, all that stuff. Todd can start it off because I think he was the first employee. <laughs> yeah, so I, uh, it actually goes back to Regatta Lanes. There was actually a first Regatta up in Fort Washington, Wisconsin, that the ownership group in Dale uh, bought first. And so I was 16 years old. I had just got my license. And uh, I grew up bowling at a different bowling center here in Cedarburg. And once I got my license, I'm like, hey, this is freedom. I, I actually can go in and bowl at other places, see what it's like. So I started driving around, bowling at different places. And I went up to Regatta in Fort. And uh, unbeknownst to me, Dale was uh, lurking in the background, uh, kind of stalking me out. I was a you know, pretty accomplished junior bowler at the time. So he knew who I was. And we both grew up in the same same hometown. In fact, later I found out the closest I ever got to him prior to that was we used to get our hair cut at the same place. So you know, we'd see each other. <laughs> long you know. Anyway, um, so and then over time, you know, Dale started talking to me and, and really insistent that I have to bowl on something tougher because everything I bowled on up to that point was all easy house conditions. So I think he had enjoyment in grabbing the spray bottle and the mop and going out there and giving a couple of spritzes down the lane and watching my ball hydroplane you know, all over the place. And, uh, but we learned a ton and I learned a ton just through Dale's tutelage that way. But then shortly after that is when, uh, they acquired Regatta two down in, uh, in Thienesville. And he had asked like, Hey, would you, uh, would you want to come help us out? I want to come work there? I'm like, absolutely. <laughs> so, and I, I want to say it was probably that day or the day after. So yeah, maybe I was the first employee. Yeah. I think I think was the second employee by a matter of hours, uh, gave him a call. And uh, and we ended up, you know, this is the summer of 94, right? 93? 94. 94. 94. And, uh, and, and again, this was a rehab job. So like Dale said, there was a lot of things that had to, that had to really take shape. And here we are at, you know, 16 years old, all of a sudden now swinging a hammer and power equipment and everything else, helping with the renovation, helping with the demolition, helping with getting the lanes back into shape. I mean, I think we became lane mechanics overnight type of thing. So, yeah. And handyman. Yeah. But, I mean, we, it was a few years down the road, and Dale's like, you know, there are A's, the, there are a bunch of A's that were in the back, and we converted them over to A2s. And we were, we were his team to converting them. And we had another guy that was kind of pointing us in the direction of what to do, but we were as a team basically putting that all together. So, I mean, that's where I started to learn how to use my hands. And, you know, a lot of what I do now, I think, has come from working at Regatta, too. He gave us freedom to do different things or we had different ideas he's like go ahead let's do it you know here's the money or whatever that type of thing um yeah. i think one of my bigger projects there is he wanted the the control car moved to the back wall and uh ended up taking that disassembling it build a whole brand new counter and moved it over and here i am 17 18 years old doing something like that yeah, and then eventually we recruited all of our friends. Uh, Dinger recruited family. Yeah, and, and before you know, we had a whole a whole crew. I mean, we were pretty much managing the, the I'd say the night activities there outside the bar, and uh, you know, we created the schedule. We just kind of self ran the whole thing, and eventually started bowling uh, together. And you know, uh, the rest is history. Put but, together birthday parties, ran birthday parties. Uh, you were the directors. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I got I got three different scars in my bowling hand attributed to different pro, I'll, I'll call it projects or index or all kinds of stuff we used to do back I, then. I, ta I taught them how to readjust the pindex because they go up and down and they have to take the flat gutters out. And we had a system or or the, or the oil, oiling stripping system with Todd and me before the Phoenix. Two and a half hours and we'd have it all done. It took a long time, but we had it down to a T. Yeah, and we got yeah. scored. But back then it was, you know, to replicate lanes like that week after week and get scores. I think we had it done pretty good. So yeah, yeah. two and a half hours, and that's a twelve lane house. Yeah. So <laughs> well, when you strip by hand and yeah. or, or in oil with a century a hundred, what are you going to get? You know, yeah. we're pushing the old stripper down the lane and back and doing all the flat gutters and cleaning the gutters and oiling. Yeah. Learn a lot. When when you first met Dale, I mean, this is in the early 90s, you know, he in 94 was the runner up in the national championship. I mean, did you know him as Dale Traber, professional bowler, uh, you know, 
runner up in, in the national championship or was he just another guy, you know, who was a good bowler around town to you? Back then? No, we, we, Dale's a legend. I mean, he was a legend to all of us. I think if you, if you paid any attention to, to any bowling, especially locally. So um, yeah, when I, when I, like I said, when I started going up to uh, regatta and Fort and bowling and I'm watching, I mean, literally Dale was kind of in the background lurking and kind of giving me the evil eye. That was daunting. I mean, I was intimidated back there, and I knew well, I'm it. analyzing your game. <laughs> I knew he was watching, you know. So, uh, and then he made the first move to come talk to me. Makes it sound like we're dating, but but no, I mean, and, so, and, uh, and finally, kind of broke the ice. And once you know, but then again, once he broke the ice, you get to know him. It's like, hey, Dale's, Dale's actually a real person, you know, and, and actually trying really, to trying you know, to teach you to bowl better. Yeah, yeah, yeah it works. I, I think the first time I Dale watched me bowl, he goes, "You need a lot of work." <laughs> <laughs> Too much. Well, Eric used to like getting four out of the middle. Forty threes he used to get. He he's, he doesn't get them too often anymore, but he gets forty four at least or forty five. <laughs> Graduated, yes. Yeah. 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 Um, Dale, that team, you know the the Lens Limited team continues its run of success. You end up, uh, you know, with a bunch of eagles. Uh, Regular doubles in 1999, team all events in 2000 and 09, regular team in 09. Uh, you know, what was that like to, uh, you know, to succeed on that level, which, you know, decidedly different from the PBA, but, uh, you know, in that team environment? Well, 99 winning the doubles, it it was strange because we ended up getting third in the team event, and I had 570, and that, I was not too pleased. They were pretty nice. So if I would gave anything, we would have won. Yeah. And the next day, Ryan and me are on a on a Ryan Lever and me are on a we're the odd ones out, and we're bowling with two guys from Chicago, and we're just going. I said these are pretty pretty decent, and they just thrown up the second arrow, and we were probably around 15, 16, and it really didn't change much. And we got about to the second game, and and these guys said, "You guys are doing pretty good." We're not gonna. We're just gonna stay where we are. Or we're just gonna watch this play out. And and the last game, I had the front ten, and and Ryan, Ryan, Ryan got a Greek church in the third for third frame. He had like a like a strike spare in a Greek church, and he ran the sheet. And we ended up winning by two pins. Um, well, I'd say this: all the years that ended in nine were really good years. <laughs> if I could have 09, 09 back, I'd, it would be a lot of fun. Yeah. <laughs> um, another uh, pro that you had a significant influence on uh, was our episode 55 guest, Chad Kloss. He recalled needing to learn some versatility because he hooked the ball a lot, swing the lane. Uh, and he came to you and said that you guys worked on his straight game for about a month. Here's what he had to say about that. I don't know how the conversation started, but I had approached him and asked him for help. And he worked with me, you know, on Monday nights after league, um, playing straighter, you know, and I remember him telling me, you know, play, I want you to throw a ball at five. I threw a shot. I'm like, there you go. He goes, no, he goes, throw a ball at five. Throw another, there it is. It's right at five. You know, he goes, no, he goes, you're hitting eight. <laughs> I'm like, no, I'm hitting five. He goes, no, you hit 12 on that one. He goes, try <laughs> to throw it in the gutter. <laughs> no, And just worked with me getting that because what people don't understand is they see, everybody sees the lane a little different. Do you feel like everybody sees the lane a little different? Definitely. Yeah. The, the bowlers and nowadays, the younger bowlers. I don't know, I just shake my head. <laughs> I can't I can't I can't I can't relate to what they do now. I would that would never that what they do nowadays you could have never ever did with the equipment that we had in the day. Yeah. There was no way you were gonna get a yellow dot, a white dot, or something like that. Or when LT came out and it was a big hooking ball, there was no way you were gonna get on a lacquer surface when it was still lacquer before it was even your thing, to get the ball to peel back like it does now with these balls. I mean, you had no angle. It used to be, if you had 600, it was a good night. If you had 700, it was really good. 800s didn't, didn't come about. And 300s are rare now. Now it's just a free-for-all. Yeah. Well, while we're on the topic of 
guys who hook the ball and and things like that. Uh, you know, you got to tell me what the deal is with stinking windups and how you staved off the glue factory for so long. <laughs> yeah, well, Nate went to the glue factory. Mike Nate went to the glue factory way before me <laughs> when I got in the windups. He's just standing in the wheel and he did it on purpose, <laughs> even though he was versatile and could do anything. And he was always trying to get me to retire, even though I did retire from the PBA at the end of the year last year. Yeah. I've had an, I had enough. I've had enough road. I want to go to racetracks, and I'm going to racetracks. Yeah. That's what I enjoy, and that's what I'm going to do. Was it that you had enough of the bowling, or did the guys have, have something to do with that? Because Jeff also said that he'd go and write eight on your score sheet, you know, just to get at you. <laughs> and he liked to push my push my pedal a little bit to get me irritated. Yeah. <laughs> uh, like I said, I did win a doubles tournament with Jeff in Iowa at, 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 at Waterloo back maybe 10 years ago. So that's probably longer than that already. But uh, we used to go and gnaw at each other while we bowled, but it was weird afterwards. You know, we could all sit down and have a good time. I think the days of that now doesn't exist. Todd seen a little bit when he bowled the PBA for a little while. He kind of seen it was what it was. He was at the end of the way it was with the two squat, the two shifts, two, two five game blocks, and that. He's seen how it was. Everybody's trying to kill each other off, and then you go out to eat afterwards, or or maybe in a bar, or go here, or go to race track, or something. But that's what we did. You know, it, it's, now it's just you bowl, you bowl the eight games, and you walk out the door. I mean, it's it's not the same. Sure. I think I, I remember for some reason you telling me back, you know, years ago that the eight thing was a racing thing. <laughs> Numbers go from seven to nine in my book. <laughs> it's an X. <laughs> As proof by the X ball that you used to throw. That's still in the basement. It's cracked. Yeah. <laughs> that was only for Vernon Hills. That was so I could, I could wreck the, I, could, I still could hook it out of the oil and outside. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How about, uh, you know, the team, you know, through the changes? You you talked about how, you know, you were at Regatta. I remember it being a three-person team with you, Todd, and Dinger. Um, eventually, you end up at Cedars, um, and now it's more than three. Um, you know, what was it like to both adapt, you know, to a different number of guys on the team and different center? Well, Cedars came about when teams went away. I, uh, Jim Zipter was here, which I knew from Deansville junior days. He was leasing the place. He actually bowled with me in Fridays at Deansville for probably about five years. And I had, I didn't want to leave a lane machine. I had the Phoenix S. I didn't want to leave it in the garage. I said, can I leave it here? He says, fine. I said, all I want to do is practice once in a while. That's fine. So I was practicing in August and it had, I didn't know it. There was a league meeting that night, and all of a sudden these guys said, oh, we start on this day. I said, what are you talking about? <laughs> oh, you're bowling with us. So that's how that's how it that it wasn't was, us. It wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't, it wasn't them. And I bowled with them for probably yeah, probably about four or five years. And it, it basically it was when the two years I was exempt on tour, I was going to work Monday, Tuesday, and if possible even Wednesday fly out and I was bowling Monday night late shift to classic Greenfield and I was bowling Tuesday night here at Cedars and I'd fly back Sunday and start over again and I was burnt to a crisp and the sec the second year I was exempt Roger Burke bowled from I got him the bowl for me because I said oh, this is just too much running around and Eric and Todd were bowling at Harbor Hills I went up there. We were short a couple teams that year, so I recruited them. I said, "Why don't we go in here? You bowl with me, and we'll get this together. Come down to Cedars." So that's how that's how it happened, and it's been yeah. it's been probably almost fifteen years already. Yeah, and it's and it, I'll tell you, this place is kind of a throwback for me, even because you know I grew up in Cedarburg. I, uh, I I didn't grow up bowling here, but I did grow up coming to watch my dad bowl here. So my dad bowled here for thirty five years. Never averaged more than I think than 158 or something. He just was here for a good time, quite frankly. And uh, and honestly, that was one of my better childhood memories when I was lucky enough to come watch. Because back then, 
every place was full. You know, this is an eight lane house and he bowled in the 16 team league, league here. So when he bowled first shift, I was allowed to come and watch since I can get home early enough for bed for school. Um, but then as I got older, I could come to both shifts. I bring my homework. I would, you know, sit here and watch. And I became friends with now some of the guys that we bowl with here on, on Tuesday nights. They were young guys back then. And, and now, uh, now we're the young guys, which is a little scary. But uh, <laughs> when you look at it, <laughs> well, yeah, it's like when you were all 65. <laughs> oh, I remember when I was the youngest. Yeah, one. Dale, Dale give us some pointers of what to expect in 20 years. But, but no, so it's, it's just kind of fun to come back and. And now we're got, I mean, we're got a, a Cedars has got absolutely fabulous owners. Um, Mark and Stacy have been here now for I think 10 years. Mike and Stacey. Mike, Mike Mark, Mark, <laughs> Mark, Mark is their son. Mark, 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 it's a whole family <laughs> affair here. Their, their son, their daughter, everybody works. It's just a great place. And they've really done a great job with, with just the whole place and the experience. And honestly, I, I think I enjoy it more. I'm actually bowling better than I have in years just because I think we just have a good time. Oh, you know? So, yeah. Um, Todd, you recently got into the Ozaki County USBC Hall of Fame. I mean, that's got to be an incredible feeling, you know, like you said, you know, to have a, a great year and then have that on top of it. And for you too, Dale, since you guys have, have worked so closely, you know, through the years. Yeah, it, it, was, a, it was an awesome honor, uh, especially having grown up bowling here. Um, you know, I, no better place for me to be affiliated uh, than quote unquote back home. You know, my, my bowling career took a, a huge shift in my early 20s from where, where it was going and where it was. And, you know, to be honored like that and, and, and really reach the highest pinnacle here locally and, and really be inducted in that year, too, with some of my, my best bowling friends growing up and stuff like that. It was really just a great, a great opportunity to be a part of that. And, and Tony here is really a lot of the credit. Tony now runs our association here locally in, in Ozaki County, and it was really turned it around. I mean, a huge credit to him. We hadn't had a Hall of Fame induction in how many years? Almost 20 years. Almost 20 years. And, uh, you know, so we had, we had a, a, I'd say a backlog. So we had a nice nice crop of, uh, of, of candidates to uh, to go in that year, and it was just a really, really cool event a couple of years ago. So, Yeah. Dale, you know, you can't talk about Hall of Fames with, or Halls of Fame without mentioning – you know, your USBC Hall of Fame induction in 2014. Um, I remember watching the, you know, the Hall of Fame video where you said something to the effect of, you know, it kind of shows that the little guy can work hard and kind of get to the mountaintop at, at the end. Um, looking back, you know, now it's been six, seven years. You know, what does that, you know, that all mean to you? Oh, definitely. Definitely. I'm the one that proves that. That you could do, you hard, work hard at it, you could, you could get there. I mean, that's the last place you think it's going to happen. Um, you don't even expect it. Um, it's it's a great honor. There's no question about it. I mean, there's not that many people in it. Um, it it's not easy. I mean, it, granted, they changed the rules a little bit with having the USBC tournament spotlighted as you know, the spotlight people for the hall of fame for that between that and when two senior masters didn't help either, or hurt either so i want enough of their events i guess that's it's, it's kind of like the unwritten rule of four four eagles is kind of like the number the common denominator to get in that way yeah give or take but that's about what it's been sure um you know <clears throat> You had the success, the you know the the success in the in the regionals, fifty two combined uh, regionals between the regular regionals and the PBA fifty regionals. Um, you know, Jeff said uh, that he has no doubt that if you would have devoted yourself to being on the national tour full time for all the years that your brother did, that you would have won multiple tour titles. Do you ever think about what could have been if things had been different? That's possible it would happen. I, I look at it this way. I was just a working person, and I would take a week off from vacation or just take off. And when they gave they gave their, the exemptions for the regionals, um, usually I was either the top or second in the points, and you got at least four exemptions from the Bowling Rabbit Squad on Tuesday to be in those tournaments. And... I knew I was in, so basically it was. I bowled Wednesday night, Thursday. I would, I would t take off from work. It was close, and all my goal was is just to get a check, because 
In those days, the entry fee was only two hundred dollars, and like Peoria was Peoria, the True Value Open always paid usually paid fifteen hundred for fifty third. And I'm looking at I can make thirteen hundred dollars, not counting in the rooms then of probably forty fifty dollars a night. So I can stay in a room for two or three nights. I sure hell wasn't going to make that working, you know. So that's how I did it. Um, and Toledo, Toledo, uh, rest in peace, Imperial Lanes, because that place was the it's great players' heaven. And that's where I bowled David. And I love the people in Toledo, and I actually had a following Toledo. For as gruff as I am, they like me in Toledo. So I. I love Toledo back, and it's about as glamorous as Milwaukee, I guess. <laughs> Maybe even more so, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, when Gus came on, uh, he uh, talked about the Mount Rushmore of Wisconsin bowlers, uh, you know, of course, the the top four of all time. He had trouble, you know, with number four, uh, but he had, you know, three – in mind and uh, and Dale, you were one of them. I want I want to play back what he said uh, about you to kind of lead that show off. Number two is is another one of my teammates. I'm sorry to say, you know, those two are front runners would be Dale Traber. Mm -hmm. uh, here's a guy that's done everything in Wisconsin. I mean, one bowling with the champs, so and that was a long time running show, and it was tough to win that. Um, the guy's got 52 PBA regional titles, really. I mean, and he won them at a point where there were 120 of the best in the Midwest. Uh, he won recently, as of the last 10 years, he's won two USBC Master Tournaments in three years. One from the loser's bracket and one from the winner's bracket. I mean, that's tough to do, winning two out of in, in three years. Um and he's won everything, and he's well respected around here. Um, but Dale would definitely be my my second. How does it feel to be <laughs> on Mount Rushmore, <laughs> according to Gus? Uh, it's good that one of my teammates say that. Um, uh, it, it's nice. I mean, there's a lot of it's, you can go back into history from way back. You know, like I said, in the 30s and 40s, there's a lot of good bowlers that are. ABC, USBC, Hall of Famers that, you know, you've never seen bowl. Um, so there's there's people in there, too. I mean, you're looking at low – you're looking at more recent times or you're looking at, you know, older times. So it, it varies. It's when the eras are. That's what I would say. Um, so you can't really go back to what the olden days was. It was a different – it was a different game. Yeah. Tell me about some of the things that, you know, you mentioned the differences. People are hooking the lane and the bowling balls are different and, and the surfaces are different and all that stuff. But are there any parts of, of bowling now that resemble the game that, you know, that you got hooked on back when you were a kid? Younger people, I don't think, don't take it the wrong way. Uh, I don't think that they have any clue what it was like. Their spare balls are what we used for the first one. Uh, Two-handed, that didn't exist. Everybody knows how I feel about that. Yeah. I like it just like that number between seven and nine. So. I guess we do now. <laughs> uh, I think that was, a, that was a bad thing for the game. It's bad for the old timers because you just couldn't do um, I don't know what they would have did in the old lane wood surfaces, especially on lacquer, because lacquer did lacquer is a soft surface that didn't hook in the back end. So I don't think their balls that they could have used would do the tricks that they do now. Plus, the lane maintenance wasn't the same either. Yeah. Um. Guys, I, I want to kind of go around the, the horn here, and, I, and I'll start with you, Kyle, just because, you know, they can kind of, you know, direct traffic on, on their end. But each of you, tell me what, you know, what it's like and what your favorite part is about being on this team that has had really so much history uh, in Ozaki County for so many years. 
Yeah, sure. So, I mean, I've enjoyed being part of these guys the last few years with, I think, uh, super competitive, uh, which is my favorite part. There is uh, not a weak link. I mean, everybody can strike, everybody can spare. And so that's a good feeling to have those guys around. Um, and then. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh but, we'll strike for a beef beef stick. <laughs> yeah, when a when a beef stick's on the line for oh, sure, right? No. Um but yeah, just and good guys. Um I, I think uh I have absolutely learned a lot. I, I think the cool thing is you know, Dale always sits down at the lanes and just watches everybody um on both teams and the lanes next to us. And so a lot of times if you're just kind of feeling lost, you just sit down next to them and He's got something, you know. He'll he'll give you something if you ask, and and so uh, I've I have absolutely learned a, a, a lot from for being on this team and and count all these guys as as good friends now. So um, yeah, absolutely great experience uh, for the last five or so years for me. Okay, and, and it looks like you're going kind of uh, let's see, right to left as you guys are facing. So. So, well, so well. Yeah, I'd say Todd got me into bowling, but Dale kept me in bowling. Uh, I tried to bowl like Todd, and I think the first ball he gave me, I launched into the gutter and cracked it and it's a few different pieces in my basement. But then I learned if I watch Dale hard enough, uh, I, I've learned a lot. And unlike maybe most of these guys, uh, he and I have a lot in common. I grew up racing. So when Todd and Dale met bowling, I was racing. And so Dale could give me pointers uh, about lanes uh, relative to how a car might work on a racetrack. And so uh, when you've been taught by the best, it's really hard to want to bowl anywhere else. I, I, because these guys taught me how to bowl, I, I won't bowl anywhere else. And the life took a turn for me. I got four kids. And in that process that I had four kids, I wasn't bowling. But every year, Dinger asked me to bowl. And finally, I said, well, I think my kids are old enough again, so I'll come back. And uh, I started back in art filters category of uh, average and clawing um, <laughs> my way back up uh, thanks to thanks to the guys. So um, this is my Mount Rushmore, if you will. Sumo's oh, are oh, so, yeah. Sumo's our sicker weapon. I, mean, yeah. I carry the handicap. He does. <laughs> and he brings it out at the right, right time. time. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Dale, Dale's, uh, um, he invited me to be in the fish heads. Uh, it must have been shortly after we moved over to, you guys moved over to Cedars here. Yeah, we lost yeah. a couple bowlers that we had, and yeah. then we needed a couple more. And so it's got to gotta be, what, 12, 13, 15 well, years or something like that. Long. It's been, yeah. been a while. And Dale, you know, is really an ambassador for this part. Um, I was uh, bowling in a scratch league that he was uh, doing some oiling in in, in the falls, and he was really getting me to be versatile, uh, trying to do different patterns. And you, you look at how he he actually teaches people and, you know, instructs. And he's, he's really just a great ambassador, not just for teaching people, but for promoting the, the bowling and, you know, everything in this, not just in Wisconsin, but, you know, nationally, as you can see, he's a OCBA or a, a Hall, Hall, USBC Hall of Famer. And uh, that, that to me is why we have a lot of glue in this, this team is because he knows if we're struggling, um, he knows how to help us out. All the team members really know all that, and that's really what makes us a, a good team. And I think, um, you know, I said it in a few ways, but it's the camaraderie, it's the connection, it's the, you know, I, there was a time in my bowling life I didn't look forward to going bowling anymore. And, and now I look at the actual – activity of bowling as that as an activity and a reason to come and hang out with these guys and uh it's not just hang out i mean we we do things outside of work we uh we both stay together now dale's even joined our state team now in the twilight of his in his bowling career um which by the way fish heads that's way up there lens uh, you know anyway uh, <laughs> but, uh, we, didn't, we didn't win we didn't win the Eagles yet. hey we got close in doubles i know sure. yeah so anyway but uh yeah and i honestly and i'm just tickled and flattered if i think back to you know 16 years old first met dale would i have at that age or, or even going back and asking myself then like would i be sitting here today sitting next to dale doing this show talking about the good times we have and especially for all of you out there that that don't know dale off the lanes i mean he has done tremendous things for all of us personally 
in our bowling lives and our, in, in just any way, shape or form. I mean, you heard the story of me and Dinger first starting to work at his place. You know, we were just kids and he gave us every opportunity to learn, to grow. I, I can look back to that time now and how that's really kind of even shaped my professional career now, some of the experience I got. And now he chooses to hang out and bowl with us here. And he's one of the guys, you know? And so, and I think that just everything here meshes. Um, we continue to have a great time and we'll keep doing this as long as we can. I know our, our bodies are not as young as they used to be. And Dale keeps telling us to well, watch out. So, well, you're self inflicted. <laughs> <laughs> a couple, a couple, but uh, no. And so it's just, uh, it's just an awesome time. And, you know, we, we really look forward to it every week. All right. I guess my turn. Uh, it's great to bowl with them. Uh, uh, from being kids that work for me, or some of them did. Andrew, Andrew, I bowled with his dad at Harbor Hills <laughs> almost 40 years ago. He wasn't even around then. So, uh, but anyways, uh, I want to give back, and I'm giving back to them. And 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 I tried to teach them back in the young days what was going on the other side of the fence, between the business side. I mean, Todd's. Put in his professional life uh he used bowling as a step stepping stone to get to where he is now and uh his career is came from bowling basically kind of backwards but uh um you know his priority is his his occupation and then bowling is second and he's and this is a good way to it's a good time being together let's just say that um we don't always win but you know, we have a good time together, and it's all that. It all that's all that matters. I guess I'm next. Um, so Tuesday nights is something I always look for every week. I mean, come here. I mean, it's just it's our team. The, the stuff we do, we have fun. We're always doing something. There's always some little gimmick that we have going on. Um, I mean, even the league. I love the league. The league is. These guys have been here for years and years and we all just get along and we have fun and you know and we make fun of each other too i mean that's that's all part of it um you're just, welcome yeah <laughs> <laughs> um should we really go there yeah <laughs> again early in my bowling career i was in high school and you know having dale to you know make me a little bit versatile i mean i still can hook the lane a little bit and you know be able to play straight and just doing all that stuff and putting the time and effort in and you know he always said that you know if you need help with something we'll set up time and we do, we do it i mean we let's say dale you know it's a i'm off on this friday let's you know put up some lane conditions and i i need to learn to do something and he's there and he's looking at you analyzing things and he tells you how it is and you know and i appreciate that um i'm also it's also you know very nice too to be able to bowl with family and some friends that i've known for probably yeah. 30 years uh well Dave and i started bowling together when we were six so yeah 40 years almost almost don't date us that bad remember plus 20. um yeah we had um as fish heads go we actually celebrated our 25th anniversary last year and we did that by winning the league there you go. Uh, we, we still have it. Yeah. We got it. <laughs> so that's really it. I mean, thank you, Dale, for everything you've done so far. I, these guys hit on it. I mean, the camaraderie, I think, is is the biggest thing for me. I, I actually probably met Dale back when I was, I guess, six years old. And I have a very vivid memory. You didn't know who I was. But my dad was telling me, Dale's not here for Junior League this weekend because he's bowling his brother on TV. And I'll remember that. And I think we reconnected probably um, in college. Um, we were bowling over at uh, Greenfield, and we were teaching how to play the lanes, putting down those strike patterns and as much oil as we possibly could to get me to try to learn how to play the lanes differently. And um, I don't bowl much anymore. I've got little kids at home, and, and life's crazy. And I'm having my best year I've ever had, um, average-wise and bowling-wise, because I come out here, I have fun. I listen to stories. I'm hearing. I've known these guys for for years. I hear new stories every week, um, so it, it never gets old. Um, you know, I Dale's. He's probably uh, he's helped me along the way. I spent six years in in Dallas, Fort Worth, right after college, and 
Um, went down there probably pretty cocky and thought I was going to be a pretty good bowler. And um, if anybody knows, there's some good bowlers down there. I came back and, uh, and uh, you know, just reconnecting with Dale and kind of welcomed me back to the fish heads. And um, I've really enjoyed it ever since. So it's, it's good to bowl with these guys. Well, Andrew used to work for the USBC. Okay, so you got to know Dale a lot through the, the Masters and events. And... Yeah, I remember uh, you came down. Gosh, I remember who was going into the hall. It's probably 2013. Was Is that when Lenny went in? You gave me the tour. I came down and I was able to give Dale and, and Gus a tour of, of USBC headquarters. I just wanted to see the room with the trinkets, with the with the patches and the, <laughs> and the key rings and all that garbage that we spend our sanctioned money on. Say what, so you show will, me. say what you will about the, the hard shell Dale. I mean, walking him through headquarters and showing him the test center where we got to practice and bowl and showing him all the historical archives in the museum. You were lit up like a like a bowling fan well, it's, there it's, that day. It's pretty cool. It's history. See. History is good. Uh, so, yeah, was that's what stories are. It's history. I think that's a great segue into my last quote from Jeff. I promise this is the last one. Um, but you know, Jeff talked to me about how you know some guys would you know kind of rip on Dale over the years, and, and sometimes within the same breath, rip on his bowling. And he said, you know, Dale won so much that even his biggest detractors had to concede that point in the end. And that he thinks that there's too many people through the years who never gave him a chance to get to know him a little. And they would have made a friend. I, I would assume that, Todd, you and the crew, and, and I certainly can attest to that, can't you? Oh, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Kyle, <laughs> Kyle probably hit on it. I mean, you're the newest to the team, Kyle. You didn't know Dale at all, right? We welcomed you in, and you knew who Dale was because he's Dale Traber, right? But he's a totally different person. When you bowl with him, you get to know him. You listen to the stories. He's he's he'll he mentioned before he'll help anybody at any time. Yeah. Um, he's just a totally different person. And if, and if any of us, yeah, if any of us were ever in trouble, you know, personally or anything, he'd be the first guy we call. He'd jump in a car and he'd come to help. I mean, that's the kind of guy Dale is if you get to know him and. The problem is everybody that bowls sees the rough, tough, hyper competitive, like Dale described, like losing sucks. And that's that's the part of Dale you, you see. Yeah, right. You know, grab a beer with him after you find out who Dale really is. And so for those of you that haven't had that chance, it's it's you know, there is definitely that that softer side and, and I think there's a theme here that if we show, you know, just show some some love for the game and, and interest in things and really just talk shop, and all of a sudden you start to break through that hard shell and and once in a while, we, you know, I've seen Dale mad a couple of times at us. We, 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 <laughs> Tigger and I, quick story, we almost died once at Dale's hand. <clears throat> I don't know what year it was, but Dale's got a, one of his most prized possessions is a Z28. Yeah. Um, uh, I'm about to call it Trans Am. It's not a Trans Am. Camaro. Camaro. Well, we might have we might have gotten his keys once. And uh, this was at Thien's. Yeah, Thien's. I was parked out there, and we uh, we snuck in there with a, a Dale Jarrett. Dale Jarrett was number oh. 80, number eighty eight on uh, a NASCAR. It was an air freshener. We hung it from his rearview mirror and just closed the door. And oh my God! Well, first off, he knew right away we did it, so there was no hiding. <laughs> and second off, we we almost literally didn't survive, and we did stay employed after that. But it was very it was very tenuous there for a while. I blew up. So. There's no question about that. <laughs> so. But we still stay friends, so you know you can you can pick on the guy and, and still survive once in a while. So as you don't take and it. I still have my Camaro. Yeah. No air freshener. No, no air freshener. No, I think that got that was the, that was eliminated immediately. Yeah. <laughs> is is this still in the glove box? <laughs> oh yes, it's a bigger uh, bottle now. Let's just say let's just say this: I will not run out of heights. <laughs> so, so Dale, Dale mentioned I bowled a couple of years with him in the uh, PBA regionals, and I traveled with him, and he always. Had a travel bottle between the seats of the van, so no matter what, what McDonald's hey, we stopped at, I don't know about. Oh, that. you had it. It's your cooler. You put it in the cooler, and we had that travel bottle. So no matter where we went, because you know, depending on which fast food restaurant, you may not get heights. So you got to have it with you. <laughs> hey, hey, Todd. I'm glad that's the story you told about traveling with Dale. <laughs> 
Yeah, I could tell him something about Dicks in Illinois. Oh, uh, yeah. No. <laughs> Well, well, I know that that Dale's got some lanes to oil in a few minutes here, Um, but I want to take this, uh, you know, in a direction that I go with all of these shows, and and that's called Off the Sheet. And what I usually ask guests to do is, you know, suggest someone, call someone out who would be a good guest on a future show. And it doesn't have to be the greatest bowler in the world. You know, somebody who's passionate about the sport and has a unique story to tell. And we really all do. So I, I want to get Dale's off the sheet before, you know, he goes to oil lanes and compete tonight. And, and then, you know, the rest can take their turn. But Dale, why don't we start with you? Who would you like to see uh, on a future episode of Bowling with the Fef? It could be a lot of people. I know one that would have a lot of stories, too. It might not might not be the greatest would be my brother. Yeah. Brother David, he'd have plenty of tour tour stories. Oh jeez. Especially mm-hmm. about when they used to have the motorhomes and all the crazy <laughs> things that went on there. I only get bits and pieces of it. Yeah. I mean some of it was just highlighted in, in uh Phil Ringner's article about with the Bowler's Journal a few weeks ago or a month ago or two months ago, whatever it was. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that was, they were using some of his references into, in that article. But that's what the life was. He, he, a lot of that was, I'd hear the stuff on tour from him. Yeah. That would be the one. And I'll tell you, I don't know if we would have met if not for your brother, because I happened to cross with him at a regional pro am in 1995. And, you know, he said, you're moving to, back to Milwaukee. Oh, you got to, you know, talk to Dale and, uh, that's how I ended up working for you, you know, in, in college. So that was, you know, that was a big deal for me. I hope, you know, I left, you know, some kind of positive impact. <laughs> I didn't get rid of you. So <laughs> <laughs> I, didn't get, I really didn't get rid of anybody. So. Yeah. Uh, no, I, you guys were all great. Um, you know where I was coming from and I let everybody, they all let, I let them do their thing. I teach them kind of where I wanted to go, and I let them handle it. Uh, while you were in there, Andy, too, a little bit with the, uh, the basically the weekends were just not but birthday parties. They coordinated. I just let the, let you guys do it, and, and it was it was a fine tuned machine. Yeah, as long as the kids, you know, stayed on the approach and yeah, behind. The I didn't go after. I didn't, I didn't go after them with the cattle. <laughs> They're out of cattle for all those. <laughs> Violators, as I call them. <laughs> but he would go and say something. He'd have us go down there and get, hey, Get you know, you gotta yeah. stay back. It was probably good for the kids. Hey, well, I know some <laughs> things that you guys. I know some things that you guys did too to get rid of people. <laughs> cool. Um, well, like I said, don't want to keep you. Uh, Six fifteen is the time right now. Uh, so if you need to hit your hit, you know. Work the I'll, oiler. You can talk to you can talk to the rest of the. Fish. That's cool, but uh, yeah, the the rest of you, I want to kind of you know go around the horn again and uh, yeah. and see if you guys have uh, some good suggestions. All right, of, up, you can talk talk to the teammates. <laughs> All, right. All right, thanks for your time, Dale. Yeah. So uh, you know, let's 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 start the same way we did last time. Kyle, uh, do you have uh, a good uh, suggestion for a future guest? Sure, I think someone that would be really interesting for you would be. Uh, my sister-in-law is the head coach of the Whitewater women's bowling team, uh, Leanne Sullivan. And actually her, my brother is the, uh, he's the teaches bowling class at, uh, at Whitewater. So they could be an interesting pair for sure. Um, talk about some of the, the college aspect of the bowling that's going on right now. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, that's a great idea. Um, yeah. Let's, uh, let's go back, uh, back to Cedars there. <laughs> I guess I'll go. Uh, I wouldn't mind seeing a uh, kind of a a list of the good ball drillers that we have in the Milwaukee yes. area. We've got uh, Lenny, oh, yeah. we've got Joey Serrar, we've got uh, Craig Miller. We've got a lot of good good ball drillers in this area, and kind of put them all in one show and kind of pick their brains mm-hmm. on what some of the greatest techniques are, are used, what they're finding with people with successes and. You know, get them out there and uh, really uh, see what their opinions are and where the future of bowling balls is going. Yeah, I like that. 
the only people in bowling that I know are here. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> and quite frankly, I think they petition me as the most interesting guy on the team. So it's either me or a guy named if you can find a guy named Dwayne. <laughs> Dwayne, uh, I, then, then one of us two, but uh, probably Dwayne. Any Dwayne? <laughs> I'm not. You'll know him when you see him. Yeah. <laughs> former former bowler here, Dwayne Scheidt. Are you uh, really supposed to? You can't say the whole name. Well, how, how is he going to get him on the show? All right, get Dwayne. I'll be on the show with Dwayne. There you go. <laughs> Um, I'm going to nominate one that, uh, he, he actually was a childhood mentor to me when I first started really bowling the competitive junior stuff in Milwaukee, took me under my wing or his wing. I'm short. Sorry. Uh, his name's Mark Gantowski. I'm sure. A lot of people that are on the show, Mark and me may even be watching it. No Mark. And if you want to continue this kind of team theme, I would encourage Mark to come on and bring his team surf ski team on from village bowl in Menominee Falls. So. I have honestly never seen them bowl as a team outside of state. They both state, but I, I quite literally every week read word for word everything that they post on Facebook. They have their own Facebook page that they will recap every single league night, and it seems like they have one hell of a good time every week. They shoot some good scores. They're obviously best friends, and I think it would actually be kind of a cool theme to see if you can get another team on here like that. But Marky Matowski and the team Serbsky team from uh, from Village Bowl, I, I challenge. I got I got a nomination on that. You're gonna have to help me with the name. Steve Sislevich. Oh, oh yes. Oh. <laughs> so okay. That's my guy. Okay, so <laughs> okay. Sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. You go, do go it. You Steve. do it. So Steve is the president of BCA, the bowling writers or bowling centers association, Wisconsin. Center. There we go. Oh yeah. Um, he he. I mean he his little house. He's got a little eight lane house up in. Amherst Junction. Um, it's it's kind of like this place. I mean, it's you know, leagues of every night, um, weekends. He's got couples leagues, or he's got some sort of nine pin tap tournament. But he knows the business up that way, and he's got a pretty good following. Yeah. So Steve Sislevich, we'll we'll say it. It's a nice Polish uh, name. But Steve, if you're uh, listening, and he would make an awesome uh, just proprietor to bring on yes. because he has got some secret sauce up there that it is just an absolute marvel to watch what he does at that place. And he's on the national board now for the BPAA, sharing his, uh, you know, his knowledge and whatnot. So Steve, Steve would be a great one too. Uh, from Whitetail Lane. Oh, yes, Whitetail Lane. Did we not give the name? No. Whitetail Lane. <laughs> Whitetail Lane, Damage Structure, Wisconsin. Go we'll, check him out. We'll be there in a couple of weeks signing autographs. Yeah. yeah we're all, actually, the fish heads are overtaking uh, Whitetail Lane's uh, mid-February for a night that's after up there. So you'll we'll oh. see us up there. All right. Um, there's a lot of good bowlers that I've met, um, in my time down in Texas and here that, you know, they just don't get the credit because, you know, they're home with their families. They're working their day jobs like Dale did. You know, these are the, the Eric Vermilius of the world, Mike Donahue down in, in Atlanta, John Shell over in Madison, um, really great bowlers that just, they don't, they're not front and center. Uh, but another one I think would be really interesting um, say what you want about the folks down at USBC. Everyone has their opinions, but there's a lot of good people working behind the scenes in there that, you know, Matt Canizaro, Aaron Smith, Terry Bigo, Mike Larson. There's so many good people in that building that would have some really cool stories to tell about, you know, what it takes to, to make this all run, uh, to get those guys in a room and, and share some of those stories. Yeah. No, I've had a lot of uh, a lot of email and, and message exchanges with Matt. He's provided a lot of the pictures that you know I've used for either for graphics or on these shows. And uh, yeah, he's been you know great to me. You know, just some knucklehead up in northern Wisconsin trying to do a live stream on bowling. So yeah, um, I, and it's it's great because I don't think anybody that you guys have mentioned has been on a previous show. So you know that's awesome to you know kind of keep the new faces coming and and all that good stuff. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, uh, you know, I want to thank you guys all for being on. I mean, this was a really cool concept. Like you said, Todd, the team concept is something different for, you know, for this show. And I, I really like how this went and I don't want to, you know, say goodbye without talking about the person who's behind the camera there. At <laughs> Peter's, uh, panning around it doesn't do that on its own and, and that's beth filter todd's yeah. wife <laughs> so I, I mean we should at least give her some credit for yeah. you know <laughs> for, for rolling with the punches and, and helping this go off without a hitch so 
yeah, thank you, Beth. And thank you all for, for being here tonight. It's really been fun to, uh, to talk about, you know, not only Dale's history, but the history of your team and, uh, best of luck tonight. I mean, you've got a league night to, to go uh, get after. Now you can probably hear Dale in the background. The vacuum's going right now on the uh, on the machine. That's his heaven out there. As, as a lot of people know, he will spend hours perfecting that out there. So, uh, yeah. Tom will send our score sheet. We're going to light it up tonight. And you have yeah. to post it with this, whatever this thing posts on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know that this thing comes with a Facebook group, so yeah, I, I'd be happy. To, <laughs> I'd be happy to plaster that recap sheet up uh, if you can get it my way. Yeah. But uh, yeah, no, congratulations on 25 years. Um, you know, best of luck tonight and uh, for the rest of the season, guys. Right. Thank you. Thank really you. appreciate yeah. it. Thanks. Bye. Appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks everyone for watching. Be just and fear not. We will uh, hopefully see you uh, this weekend uh, live from Waterloo, Iowa.